It's about being able to share all the things that we eat and to normalize how great our culture is. These dishes survive war and resettlement. We've all got that story about someone making fun of your lunch. But how much do you assimilate without losing sense of self? Welcome to Washington Post Live. I'm Michelle Yehi Lee, Tokyo Bureau Chief for the Washington Post, covering Japan and the Korean Peninsula. We continue our Race in America series with veteran journalist Lisa Ling. Thank you so much, Lisa, for joining us. Oh, Michelle, so nice to see you. How does that feel to say Tokyo Bureau Chief? I, I understand that you have recently taken on this post. It still feels really surreal. <laughs> I can't believe I'm I'm doing this. Job. It's been like seven months. I'm here in Tokyo. It's 11 p.m. So good to see you. <laughs> well, massive congratulations. Uh, thank you. Thank you so much. Um, it's an honor to be talking with you today. And a reminder to our audience, we want you to join in on this conversation. So please tweet your questions and comments to the handle post live. And welcome and let's get started. Um, so I watched your show. It is delightful, delicious. I'm so jealous of all the food you got to eat. It's such a great mix of you know, celebratory, educational, personal, and just really inclusive of the many different communities in the API diaspora. So what was the inspiration behind doing a show about food? Well, the truth of the matter is take out I can't even say that it was a dream because I never thought that it could be possible one day to produce a show that highlighted Asian American stories and history and culture through the lens of food. Uh, my, my own uh, background was something that I was uncomfortable with. I, I struggled with my, my ethnic identity growing up. I never felt totally American, nor did I know the first thing about being Chinese from China. And so I really struggled with identity, a, a crisis of identity. And, and, and food was a big part of that. You know, I was very ashamed of the food that my grandmother would make for us. I, I rarely invited people over to my home because it, it, it smelled like Chinese food. And we all know it kind of just sticks to you. Um, and, and, and the idea of even taking Chinese food to school for lunch was just something unfathomable. So. The fact that that I, I uh, we got this show greenlit that would explore that would go on to explore these incredible immigrant stories in this country through the lens of a food that I grew up uh, you, you know with so much shame around was really something that I never thought was possible. And in the beginning of the pandemic, uh, I was supposed to do another show for HBO Max that was that was very global, and obviously everything got shut down. And so we submitted a number of other ideas for shows. And to my shock, they greenlit this show about uh, Asian American food. And interestingly enough, I think these days we've all come to recognize that although the scapegoating of Asian Americans has increased exponentially in the wake of COVID, there has been a pattern of scapegoating of Asian people in this country that spans generations, that has gone on for more than a century. Yet somehow, despite the discrimination, Asian American food or Asian food has somehow been able to transcend that. I mean, I think it's fair to say that most people in America, most people around the world love Asian food. I mean, here in, in, in this country alone, there are more Asian restaurants than McDonald's, Taco Bell, Wendy's, and Pizza Hut combined. And so we wanted to just dig into that, like how, despite these the, 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 these years of discrimination, this food has been able to transcend all of it. 
Yeah, I mean, absolutely. You've just touched on so many things I want to ask you about, especially this moment in API history. I, I agree with you that, you know, food, we can all come around um, together and it's such a uniting factor. And, you know, as, as a kid growing up as well, I remember like kind of going for the Lunchables rather than bringing my mom's food to school. So there was always that like sort of identity that we've grappled with growing up. Um, but, you know, through your show, you show how food can serve so many different purposes, keeping history, finding identity, like you mentioned, finding agency, especially during the time of trauma, like the Vietnamese refugees um, and in and, and the midst of tragedy and, and food as a means of diplomacy and community building, you explore so many different aspects of it. So I'm curious, you know, as you did this exploration of food's role in race, identity and history, What's something new or surprising that you learned um, through your research and reporting um, and showmaking process? I'll be honest, I, I learned an immense amount while working on takeout. The, the fact of the matter is Asian American history is not taught in schools. I was born in, in Northern California. I grew up going through the, the American school system and I never learned anything about Asian American history. I never learned about the, the, the vast and incredible contributions that Asian American people have made in this country. I never learned about um, the, the, the severe levels of discrimination that the community has endured. And so all of this was for me an incredible learning experience. You know, I, I grew up just outside of Sacramento, California. Uh, in a, in a non-diverse suburb, as I said, just carrying so much shame and, and was teased relentlessly. I mean, I was a fairly popular kid, but not a day would go by throughout middle school and high school when I wasn't teased about my ethnicity. So it was it was um, just this real source of, of, of pain that I rejected for so long. And so um, to go back and, and do an episode about Sacramento and the rich Chinese American roots in my hometown. It was like for the first time in my 47 years of life, I felt connected to my hometown and I felt connected to those Chinese American roots. And the stories are there. You just have to go digging. And, and I do think that one of the reasons why it has been easy to uh, discriminate or scapegoat Asians in this country is because our stories haven't been told. Our history is is unknown. And so when you're a kid and, and, and you're in school, like this is the time when empathy is developed. And it's so, so important for our kids growing up to be exposed to a, a, a diverse kind of American history. And, I, and I'm so glad that there are, that there's this movement to try and infuse American history with, with more diverse stories. At the same time though, um, I've just been a, a astounded by this debate a, a, a around quote unquote critical race theory and, and what kinds of history to teach our schools. Because really I've always believed that the more we know about each other, uh, the smarter we become, but ultimately the better we become. And I think that we can all recognize over the last couple of years in this racial reckoning that's been happening in America, that we all need to do a better job uh, of becoming better. Um, and, and I think teaching our kids and, and also immersing ourselves in more diverse uh, histories will lead us in that direction. Yeah, I mean, you know, the the need for this curriculum um, is something that you've obviously you've testified about the lack of um, education around the API community. And we've seen a couple states now requiring the teaching of this history in public schools, but we still have a long ways to go. And, you know, you've talked about the, the need to be able to infuse these stories throughout different parts of society. You obviously have a huge platform as a longtime journalist yourself. Um, I work for a news outlet, but what more do you hope to see done to fill in those gaps? Education is, of course, one aspect. What more, you know, do you hope to see? Well, there have been some incredible developments over the last few years. I mean, we're starting to see Asian faces in leading roles in pop culture. 
um, which is really exciting. I mean, I I've been in this business for over 30 years. I started when I was quite young and there were so few. I mean, I felt like for so long, I was one of the only ones. And, and frankly, the only reason I pursued broadcast journalism is growing up, um, there was one Asian person on a national stage and that was Connie Chung. And she allowed me to know what was possible. And I would venture to guess that if you asked most Asian American journalists of my generation, we would all cite Connie Chung as our inspiration because again, um, she, she allowed us to know that this is something that we could do. And so increasingly, we're starting to see um, more Asian American faces. We're seeing more Asian American faces in politics. Um, which is which is just awesome to see. And, uh, you know, we have so many incredible political leaders who are just so assertive and 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 um, just uh, you know Tammy Duckworth, Maisie Hirano, Ted Liu here in California. Um, and and I had a conversation with with Ted Liu, uh, my congressman actually, and he said, you know, even though there aren't many of us in Congress, if there were uh, the thirteen of us. Uh, during World War II, in these seats, he said, "I don't think that that we would have seen 120,000 Japanese Americans become interned during World War II." So things are changing, and I do think that out of this crisis, um, a movement has really been kicked off, where Asian Americans who have stayed silent in most cases or been on a, been been a, a afraid to speak out are unwilling to remain silent any longer. You know, you mentioned Connie Chung being the trailblazer who's, uh, who carved that path for you. For me, it was you as well. It's, you know, people who have said, um, oh, you wanna join journalism? You mean like Lisa Ling? Or, <laughs> you know, you should go on TV, you should be like Lisa Ling. So it's really the, you are a trailblazer yourself. And I think it's really important that you're speaking out on this uh, need to really lean into the identity and, and, you know, celebrate the joys of our community as well. And to that end, I want to play a clip of you and um, bring some of your family story in. This is a clip of you at Hop Sing, the Chinese restaurant in Sacramento, once owned by your grandparents. So let's take a look. Mom was the strong one. The poor woman would cook in the kitchen. It would be 110 degrees. My Aunt Anna grew up in the restaurants our family ran in the Sacramento area, including this place, Hop Sing. It's also interesting that you and I never learned how to cook. Grandma never taught I us know. how to cook. Because I think she, she didn't want us to have to work in a restaurant. Yes, we were the future. It was here that my grandma learned to cook dishes that most Chinese had never even heard of. Chop suey, egg foo young, dishes that appealed to their non-Chinese clientele. This is such a yeah, that, that, that Michelle. That by the way was the first time I had ever consumed egg foo young or chop suey, <laughs> because those were dishes that my grandmother would make at home. You know, they were dishes that were specifically uh, created to cater to a non-Chinese palate. So that was a, an experience unto itself. <laughs> yeah, I, I chuckled when you said that. Um, I used to have a Chinese American roommate who said the same thing. She was like, "I've never eaten egg." <laughs> and these things in China. Um, but uh, you know, this is such a deeply personal project for you. Um, and this episode especially was so intimate and personal. Um, and in the spirit of reclaiming our stories and uh, you know celebrating our history, tell us about your family. What has led your family to open up this Chinese restaurant in Sacramento? Um, give us a, a look inside um, your family experience in America. Well, another reason why this series is is so special to me um, is because restaurants have been for so many Asian immigrant families a means for survival. My own grandparents, they immigrated to America in the late 1940s, although my grandfather had gotten his education uh, here. In the late 1920s, he went to NYU and got an MBA from the University of Colorado. 
and my grandmother uh, had a, a music degree from Cambridge in England. They spoke perfect uh, English. My grandmother even had a British, uh, British accent. But when they finally moved to California in the late 1940s, my grandfather couldn't get a job in finance because he was Chinese. And so they ended up living with their two kids at the time in a converted chicken coop and doing odd jobs. And eventually they saved up enough money to open the first Chinese restaurant in Carmichael, California. They, they, they later went on to open that restaurant, Hop Sing, in Folsom. Um, but for them, and, and by the way, neither of them even knew how to cook when they opened that restaurant. Um, my grandmother would just toil and, 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 and work so hard in the kitchen. And one day one of the cooks didn't show up. And so she ended up becoming the cook in the restaurant. And, and, and that's one of the reasons my grandmother was so insistent that I not learn how to cook because for her, restaurants were solely, and cooking was solely a means for survival and she wanted better for me. Wow. I mean, that's such a, in, you know, it, it's a complex feeling, right? To know that your family, that's what they went through as a means of survival, as a means of assimilation. Um, and then, you know, want it better for you and didn't even want you to cook. But then now you're coming through this journey yourself through food. And, I, you know, that's such a powerful circle, I think, in a way. I think my, my grandmother, um, to whom I was very, very close, I think that her jaw would hit the, the, the table to learn that her beloved granddaughter would one day be, be fronting this show about Asian American culture through food. I mean, I think that I, 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 I can hear her saying like, you know, I can't imagine anyone would be interested <laughs> in watching this kind of a show. Who would possibly, um, even though she would tell me stories of um, how people would wait, non-Asian people um, knowing knowing how hard she was working in the kitchen would would wait sometimes more than an hour for her food that um, the restaurant would always be packed um, and she was always so surprised by how this palate um, became so desired you know this this Chinese food palate um, I, I I received a really heartwarming message on social media not too long ago um, from a woman I posted about my grandparents story their journey in the restaurant and she said, I just want to let you know that my own grandparents would travel through California. And it was during a time when black people weren't allowed to come into the restaurants. This was in the 1950s. And she said, um, my grandparents always talked about your grandparents and how they welcomed them into the restaurant and, and allowed them to eat there. And she said that her grandmother, every time she saw me on TV, she would always say to her, grand, her granddaughter, um, she comes from really good people. And I learned this story um, over the last couple of years. And it just it just warms my heart um, to know that my own grandparents were, were so sensitive to those issues and having de dealt with so much discrimination themselves really opened the door for others who were experiencing similar levels of discrimination. Wow, that's really incredible. I mean, that speaks to the power of food as community building and creating spaces for otherwise marginalized communities and just absolute inclusion. I, that's such a powerful <laughs> detail you've learned about your family. <laughs> um, yeah, you know, yeah, and I, it's something I wish I could I could talk to my grandparents about today. You know, I mean, I just think in some ways I I, I would. I don't know that they ever would say that they achieved the American dream um, because they just, they worked so hard and literally seven days a week that restaurant would be open over every holiday. My aunt told me that every single birthday was celebrated in the restaurant and she remembers having a meal at home maybe two times in her entire, throughout her childhood. Um, and so again, to be able to, to experience this time right now um, when when we're seeing so many more Asian faces and, and, and that people are interested in knowing these stories. I think she would be astounded, but just so, so proud. 
Well, I want to um, ask you about API experience in this moment and activism. You know, in the past two years of the pandemic, as you know, uh, the API community has been facing growing attacks of xenophobia and hate and as we said earlier, this is not new. The community has faced this sort of discrimination from the moment Asians set foot in this country since the late 1800s. But you know, we've seen a lot of um, activism spur from this and a lot of pride come out of it as well as the pain. And I'm wondering what you see as different in this moment. Is there something that sets apart the, the, post, the COVID era activism in API experience from maybe previous experiences that have galvanized the community. And years from now, what do you think we will remember about API community experience and activism around this moment? Well, I think that out of this crisis, Asian Americans have become galvanized in a way that I've never experienced in my 48 years of life. And it's been really incredible because I think, Michelle, you can attest to the fact that um, most of us have experienced um, a lot of microaggressions and even aggressions throughout our lives. And, and we have been made fun of, or we've been, uh, you know, we've been diminished or um, we've been, you know, uh, people have been really condescending. Um, and, and I think so many of us have for a long time kind of felt on the periphery. And in, and in some ways we felt like we have had to fight these these fights alone. And what's been really beautiful in moving is this recognition among Asian Americans that we are our own category unto ourselves. I mean, I, I think, Michelle, you're, are you Korean American? Yes. Okay. Yeah. So you and I have more in common with one another than I have probably with anyone from China and that you probably have with anyone from Korea. You know, the Asian American diaspora itself is, is vast and diverse, but it is its own sort of demographic, right? Um, Asian American food is its own kind of cuisine that is different from what you would consume in, in Asian countries. And while in the past, I think the community has been very disparate because it's so vast and diverse, I think that, that what has happened over the last couple of years in the perpetrators of attacks on Asians, not discriminating between who might be Filipino or Korean or Chinese, that has brought all of us together to stand up against it as one community. And it's been so powerful. I mean, it's been so hard in the beginning of this pandemic, I would, you know, I was being asked to, 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 um, to, to do a lot of interviews and my legs would shake under the table because it was so unnerving and uncomfortable and scary to talk about these attacks that were happening in our community. Um, but I felt like as, as one of the few Asian Americans with a little bit of a profile that I, I, I felt compelled to speak out. I mean, if I don't use my platform to speak out against these horrific attacks and injustices, then what's the point of having a platform? And I, I hope that one day, my kids and my kids' kids um, will talk about this moment in history and, and feel proud of the role that their mother and grandmother and great-grandmother played in this because we are living through this moment in history that our kids and our grandkids and their kids will read about one day and they will ask where we stood, right? They will ask, did you stand up for, for other people? And, you know, I would like my, my relatives to be able to say that I did. Speaking of family, you know, as a mother, I imagine you've had to have some of these difficult conversations with your own children, as many parents in, in the Asian American community might be having for the first time. Um, what, how have you handled those conversations and what have you tried to impart to your children um, as they experience this moment? I mean, kids pick up so much and I'm sure they've, you know, kids all over the country are picking up about this moment and hearing about COVID and China and all that. So how, how has that experience been for you? Well, it's been incredibly difficult, um, especially talking about how 
Asian people are just being blatantly and brazenly attacked for, for no other reason other than the fact that they have Asian faces. Um, my kids are in elementary school and it's interesting because they learn um, about black history. I mean, they learn about Martin Luther King Jr. They learn about Rosa Parks. Um, they learn about the civil rights movement. And it's, it's, it's incredible that they are reading these books about these significant moments in American history. And it's, it's so much more of a diverse history than I certainly was exposed to growing up. But until up until the last couple of years, Again, Asian American history was absent from, from, from their, their education. And just recently, their school has been introducing um, more, more Asian American stories. They even showed one of the episodes of, of my show. And I have been um, talking to them a lot about Asian American history. And I think that it's been... Um, it's it's been hard to talk about, especially what's been happening recently. But it's it's contributing to, um, I think, them really understanding the need to to be an advocate for all people, um, and and that's been really powerful. You know, my my eldest daughter, who's eight years, who, who just turned nine, but um, about six months ago, a boy in her school called her Ching Chong. And without missing a beat, her best friend said, I will not be a bystander to this <laughs> and told the teacher about what had happened. <laughs> and that moment was a, just a testament to one incredible parenting, right? But two, just this idea of expanding the dialogue and talking about marginalization and talking about uh, how people might be treated just because of the color of their skin. And if we, if we had more kids like my, my daughter's best friend or more parents who are willing to have those hard conversations um, and, and promote this idea of standing up for each other, I think that, um, that, that our world would be a better place. If we had had those experiences, if we were taught these things when we were growing up, I don't think that we would be um, in this place right now where, where our culture, our politics, um, uh, you know, so much of what we are dealing with day to day have become just so incredibly divisive. I think that if we had had the opportunity to read some of the incredible children's books that are available now, I think as a culture, we would be, be far more empathetic than we are. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, something that gives me hope during, especially during moments of you know, really grappling with the violence is stories like what you just said about your daughter's friend. This, the, my hope that the children now growing up with more of an infusion of API culture and, and visibility in, in, you know, around them, even watching Sesame Street, they see an Asian American character for the first time, that I hope that it actually brings a new level of awareness and, and empathy among the next generation. But um, it, before we go, I, I do have one final question for you, because I hear from API journalists all over the country that they still struggle to pitch nuanced and careful and thoughtful stories about the community and the experience beyond like a simple hit. And sometimes they're asked like, what's the newsworthiness of this story when these violent violence, violent cases keep happening? You know, it's yet another case of an Asian person being attacked. Why should we cover this one? We already covered the last one. You know, I hear a lot from a lot of journalists struggling with this. And um, as a, a longtime journalist with your platform and with your experience pitching these stories throughout your career, what's your advice? How can we push for more of these stories from local newsrooms to regional, national newsrooms, even global? How can we do better as journalists? I've, I've heard this from a number of my Asian American journalist friends that they are really struggling even to get these stories of these violent attacks covered. Um, I would say it just continue to be persistent. I mean, so many of the things that have happened in the last couple of years, I never thought possible. And, and, and you know, something really has interesting has happened over the last couple of years. I mean, I think in the wake of George Floyd and just seeing people um, uh, demanding uh, increased attention, media attention, increased attention in general, um, not allowing our voices to be silent, um, 
standing arm to arm, hand to hand, shoulder to shoulder with one another, continuing to, to demand more coverage of our community in a depth-filled way. I mean, I would love to see newsrooms um, cover more stories about mental illness in this country. When we look at so many of the attacks in New York City that have been perpetrated um, on Asian Americans, so many of the, 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 the assailants um, are, are, are suffering from pretty severe mental illness. I mean, it, this is such an important story. And I think with, because COVID, the pandemic has been weaponized, um, you know, there, 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 there is this like tension, there's this like ticking time bomb that is happening in New York City. I mean, they, they're about to construct the largest jail in the world in Chinatown. Um, and there are so many dynamics at play in, in so many ways, that jail lies at the intersection of so many of these issues. You know, Chinatown has for so long, like Harlem, frankly, in New York, become this, this dumping ground in so many ways, right? I mean, there are already six homeless shelters, almost more than any in, in anywhere else in the city with plans to build three or four more. And what happens um, when people are who are mentally ill become incarcerated? Because so often they do, and there's nowhere for these people to go uh, to get help. They either end up in jail or they're on the streets. Well, very often, um, they commit crimes related to their mental illness or drug addiction. They go into jail where they get treated and they get the medication that they need. But then when they're released, there's, there's nowhere to go but the streets. And so they inevitably end up in many of these homeless shelters with no access to medication. And because COVID has been weaponized, um, they go back into the streets and and, 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 and so many cases of violence have followed this pattern. And so this is a story that we can no longer ignore. And so my challenge to newsrooms um, in New York and throughout the country is to really dig deeper into the mental health crisis that we're experiencing in this country. Yeah, well, thank you for that. That's such an important topic. And I do hope that many newsrooms listen and follow through. And I know that your words of encouragement and tenacity will be uh, really welcome for many Asian American and Pacific Islander journalists. So thank you. And um, I can't believe it, but unfortunately, that's all the time we have. <laughs> um, it has been such an honor speaking with you. You're a role model inspiration, and I really admire the work you're doing. Um, and it's it was great to watch your show. I hope to try hot Cheeto Spam Musubi one day. It looks delicious. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you so much for speaking with me. Thank you, Michelle. It's been such a pleasure. And again, congratulations on your new post. And I wish you so much success. And I, I can't wait to uh, to read and know more about all things Asia through through your work. <laughs> Thank you. And thank you all for joining us. Uh, please head to WashingtonPostLive.com to register for all the upcoming events hosted by the Washington Post. I'm Michelle Yehi Lee. Thank you so much for joining Washington Post Live.